our main event, getting animal issues into mainstream media. Folks, animal issues are some of the most pressing of our time, arguably one of the most um, pressing of our time. Yet, you wouldn't know it in the media. Um, media coverage for animal issues has uh, come a remarkable way in the last 10 years, I have to say, and we'll discuss that. But we have so much further to go. And our panel of media experts from a variety of backgrounds are going to explore with us tonight why animal stories aren't getting enough airtime and what can be done to change that. So Kirsten, can I get you to spotlight as I start to introduce, introduce these fine folks? Now, uh, we have much longer bios on the event uh, registration page, but I'm going to keep them a little briefer for this. Um, Jessica Scott Reed is Canada's most prolific journalist covering animal protection issues. Her work can be found regularly in the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Winnipeg Free Press, for sentient media and planet friendly news. She's an animal advocate based out of Winnipeg. Jessica, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we're having this conversation today. Me too. Um, I and you are you are a, a friend. You a big friend of animal justice, uh, and so we uh, love and uh, adore you personally. But we especially love and adore your work. <laughs> um, Kirsten, I don't know if everybody's spotlit. I think it's just. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, as we are getting everybody else. Okay. Onwards, Keisha Jerome is co-founder of the public relations agency Evolotus, which works with vegan companies, nonprofits, and campaign uh, and campaigns, documentaries, and other clients. They uh, serve a unique niche in the animal rights and vegan movement by providing professional media relations, communication, strategic planning, and public advocacy. And since 2006, she's helped nearly 100 organizations gain positive mainstream media coverage. Keisha, thank you so much for joining us thank you for doing this yeah and Keja I you know I was just saying before we went on Keja was uh helped uh, us in the group that was Mercy for Animals Canada back in 2012 get the first um extensive undercover investigation into factory farms out into the media in Canada so Keja thank you good times yeah, good times. It really was. There's some war stories there. We'll get the, into those later. Um, Wayne Chung is a lawyer and co-founder of the Simple Heart Initiative. He's led teams that have rescued dozens of animals from factory farms and has organized successful campaigns to ban fur in San Francisco and California. He faces decades in prison. Woohoo! Boohoo! For challenging so-called ag gag laws across the nation, um, his most recent trial involving an open rescue at the largest pig farm in the nation, Smithfield, led to his acquittal in October of 2022. Woohoo! Um, uh, Wayne's work uh, as an open rescue activist with the grassroots network Direct Action Everywhere has been reported on in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and ABC's Nightline. We want a little bit of that action. Hello, welcome, Wayne. It's nice to be here. Thanks to everybody for having me today. Uh, Wayne, you are a legend, you day says. <laughs> you are indeed my friend. Thank you. And we, last but certainly not least, Jenny Splitter is the managing editor of Sentient Media and an award-winning journalist covering food, agriculture, science, climate, and health for outlets, including The Guardian, Vox, Everyday Health, Popular Mechanics, The Washington Post, and New York Magazine. Oh my goodness, Jenny. We are so happy to have you and your brilliance here today. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Oh, Camille, Camille Lapchuk, head of Animal Justice, said, oh, my God, the entire panel heroes. And I agree. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So, okay, folks, let's get into it. I, I'm so curious, as, as I have mentioned, um, not only am I the director, I haven't even introduced myself, I'm Kimberly Carroll. I'm the director of Animal Justice Academy, also campaign strategist with Animal Justice and a coach for Changemakers. And I also was a television host and producer for 15 years. So this is a particular area uh, of passion for me. Uh, and I am so excited to hear what our panelists have to say. So folks, first of all, I don't think I've ever seen such a voracious appetite for all things animals on social media, okay? And I'm, I'm not just cats and dogs here, all species of animals. Uh, sweet animal videos are at an all-time high 
Yet, surprisingly, the enormous ethical and environmental issues around the abuse of the billions of animals um, that are happening on this planet is getting so little ink in comparison. So I want to go around the circle and just find out what do you think is most at play for the lack of media that happens considering what a vital global issue this is. And I want to start, Jessica, I'm going to start with you, my dear. What's your what's your take on it? It's I, I don't want to just state the obvious because the obvious, of course, is that everyone loves cats and dogs. Uh, and as much as people like to say that they love pigs and cute cows, having to love them to the point of not eating them or to even um, reconsider the idea of factory farming uh, means that they have to make changes. And so psychologically to, to bring this conversation to the masses um, is difficult. And so we have different steps along the way, not only um, you know engaging with audiences, but engaging with editors to want to have those stories told in mainstream media is a challenge. So I think it's, it's really all about the the change in culture, cultural shifts that need to happen. We're seeing it slowly but surely now, conversations around dietary change, around environmental activism. These things all have to go hand in hand before and while we talk about animal farming um, and not just pets. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jess. Thanks for getting us started. And uh, as as we know in media, the obvious needs to be stated. <laughs> That's the first thing you do, right? Here I am. Here I yes. am. <laughs> Wayne, how about you? What is happening? Where is the disconnect happening? Yeah, I, I think Jessica is spot on that kind of this cognitive dissonance avoidance is a big part of the story. But the, the other component that I think is really important that hopefully is a little more empowering than that and that we can change something about is that the media is ultimately driven by consumer sentiment. And there's a great paper by an economist named Matthew Gunskow about media slant, what drives media slant, what causes the media to report on some things, not another. And what he found is that ultimately it's what people read. And mm -hmm. I'll just give you an illustrative example of how, when you have an empowered network of people sharing your content, it can drive enormous amount of media coverage. When Lily and Lizzie were subjected to FBI search warrants and raids, these are two piglets who rescued from a factory farm in Utah. Initially, we didn't get a lot of media coverage. I was calling the Washington Post, New York Times, no one was biting. Uh, and then Glenn Greenwald, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, wrote a piece that had a very strong animal rights angle and just told a dramatic story of FBI agents crossing the entire country trying to chase down these piglets. And The Intercept had never really published anything that significant on animal rights, but mostly because we had enormous base of activists sharing this all over Facebook. It was shared 130,000 times on Facebook alone. Not only did millions of people hear about this case in this trial, but The Intercept subsequently published something like a dozen other stories about animal rights because they saw, wow, when we publish something on animal rights, there's enormous audience sentiment and audience engagement in the story. So a huge part of what we need to do is just get a base of people willing to share and engage in these stories because a lot of these media outlets are just corporations trying to get clicks. They want more advertising dollars and the way to get that is to have you click and share and comment on these stories. Good point. Mm, so yeah, so it gets back, it gets back to the viewer, gets back to the public, the media is following the public is, is where, where you're coming from, Wayne. Okay. By the way, Debbie says, when aliens arrive and ask us to take them to our leader, I want to bring them to Wayne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can all agree on that one. Yeah. <laughs> that, that will be the end of the human species if you do that. <laughs> You really don't want me in that negotiation. Oh, amazing. Um, Jenny, how about you? Where, what do you think is happening here? What do you think is, is causing this, this sort of delay in response in the media? Um, it's interesting. I think like, I'm, I, I really like both what Wayne and Jessica had to say. I mean, I think I, from my experience, I think, um, you know, as a journalist and now, uh, you know, on the, more on the editorial side, I think sort of the baseline um, of the way people talk about animal ag is, is that most people are not vegan. And so it is kind of like if you start with the language of sort of animal activism and or vegan advocates, it does immediately alienate editors and people, you know, have sort of a strong reaction to it. I think 
in some cases more than they would other forms of advocacy for some reason, probably because, you know, yeah, like the baseline is, you know, an animal ag based food system. And so it immediately, you know, people sort of immediately kind of go on the people I'm thinking about editors <laughs> kind of go, oh, I don't know, that sounds you know, two out there or like, you know, we have to be balanced, et cetera. Like, and so I think um, in some ways, like I like the Jessica said steps. I feel like at least this is what I say to my writers because I feel like I'm sort of new to the movement as someone who came to this world more from climate coverage and like food systems coverage that I usually say like, you know, lead with facts, but also walk people through the yeah. steps and don't assume that they kind of already have this, this knowledge um, and really like set of, you know, ethics or beliefs that you have. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's remembering that the media is like the public. I mean, they are complicit in a lot of the things we're talking about. And so we have to, we have to make it palatable for them. We have to be able to make it something that we don't create the kind of shame and also alienation that we we can <laughs> as a movement um, in, in pitching stories. So, and Jenny, I want to get more into that in just a second. Okay, we're going to come back to that because it's an amazing point. Um, and and Keja, first of all, somebody said I'm pronouncing your wrong name wrong. Am I? Rhymes with, am rhymes with amnesia. If that helps, yeah. Keja, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because Keja was so good because she puts her pronunciation of everything. And I, I love that. I, I like she first name, last name and everything. So I practiced it. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. <laughs> so Keisha, what is your take on, on this? What is your take on why? Certainly the all of the, all of the above, you know, journalists are largely animal exploiters and we like to think that they're somehow more sophisticated than the average Joe, but the truth is they've got the same cultural programming that everybody else has going on. So I do think that's important. I, I, I think, and there's another, you know, a, another issue is that newsrooms are shrinking mm -hmm. and I, I'm actually quite worried about the news media and the people who work in it um, these days. Uh, certainly, you know, you also have issues like media outlets, even the so-called public ones that are funded by corporations that exploit animals. Our issues are challenging to that system. And when we're talking about animal issues, I mean, I think we all understand we're talking about farmed animal issues here. You know, we're not talking about companion animals. We're not talking about animals used for, for you know, this is this is the, the, main issue, the main issue we're having trouble getting into mainstream media. So, you know, just to be clear on that. I, I think that yes, some journalists have had negative experiences with other activists that that will put up a wall that doesn't do the rest of us any favors. But I also want to say, just because I'm kind of feisty tonight, um, I, we're acting like we're entitled to press coverage mm. for our efforts. And I, I, I really sort of want to, I want to take a step back from that and say, we believe this is the biggest issue in the world. It's what we've dedicated our lives to and our careers to in most cases, so we sort of need it to be the biggest issue in the world. I mean, but it isn't to everybody else. And we sort of have to leave space for the possibility that a journalist just doesn't agree with us, that this is the most important thing in the world right now. So true. That is so true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we were most of us here have incredible have del delved into so many aspects not just the animal ethics but the environmental impact and everything so we we have a really good sense of actually how big of an issue it is but but remember most people but don't have that really sense. Good. when we're talking about issues that don't get covered in mainstream mm -hmm. media we're in really good company. Yeah, I know. Well, look at the environmental movement for how many years. They've known this isn't new news that we're heading towards an apocalypse. It's just finally getting picked up. And I, I want to talk about that and and what's changed for that. But you know, before we but before we delve into some of these topics more deeply, first I, I want to acknowledge the good news. Um, and, and that is that media coverage of animal issues uh, and veganism is just a hell of a lot better than it ever has been before. I mean, night and day from when I began in the movement, I, I mean, if I remember if, if something got in the, you know, the, the paper, like an actual animal rights thing, it was like, 
everybody knew about it because it was so rare. And now it's like stories every day. Mm -hmm. And so I I think, you know, can you share your experience of this and what you've noticed in this regard? Um, Let's start with you, Wayne. Yeah, there's there's definitely a newfound appreciation, especially for farm and animal issues. And when I got started as an animal rights activist 20 years ago, even the animal rights movement itself wasn't really that focused on farm animal issues. It was hard to get people talking about pigs, cows, and chickens because the thought was when 99% of people are eating them, we really can't talk about this issue without creating a huge amount of antagonism. And I actually attribute a lot of this success to the animal rights movement's shift in framing, that we are focusing a lot more on systemic and policy level issues. I'm not saying we don't talk about veganism, and I think we should talk about veganism. And I think it's a wonderful way for people personally to make an impact on what's happened to farm animals. But the focus and the renewed kind of uh, research and, and campaigning and advocacy around policy issues has been pretty crucial, I think, to get the media to think about this issue in a way that doesn't create a lot of defensive reactions. Mm-hmm. So reframing. Okay, I want to come back to that. Um, Jenny, what, what are you seeing as sort of proof that things are a change in? Um, well, in the, in the, well, I mean, first of all, just like what Wayne's saying is, I mean, it's kind of in a way, weirdly my story because I wasn't, I mean, I've only been a vegan for like, like a little over a year now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was one of those like vegan for the climate, I guess, people that everyone's upset with. (laughs) Um, I mean, I just started out like, I started out not eating beef and then, you know, looking into what, what, the more that I covered more of the animal, like of animal farming and factory farming, that kind of led me down this path. Um, and so I do think it is like, you know, more, more, um, people, you know, talking of researchers to dive into these systemic issues. And also I guess coverage of, food systems more holistically and how all these like impacts are connected. I mean, that was what like connected the dots for me and and what was really like interesting to me in my own coverage. Um, And I guess at at Sentient Media, just like since I've only been there since July, what was super interesting to me and positive in the short term is that, um, you know, part of what I did as a freelancer was to do some science writing and science journalism. So we've done some of these uh, stories that are like on oh look chickens are as playful as puppies who knew like a really quick story and it ends up doing really well um and you know there is this appetite this this sort of like curiosity about animals that people googling you know which animals are most intelligent you know which animals feel pain all this kind of stuff that does give me some hope that people are curious about these things um and so we're trying to really tap into that um you know, I don't know what, I don't know, like what, what drove that. I was really surprised to, to see it. It wasn't something I was paying attention to as a freelancer. So, um, but I, but I think that's, that's a positive sign for sure. Amazing. Um, uh, Keisha, how about you? Yeah, I, I think, I think compared to even five years ago, mainstream media takes their issues more seriously and the coverage is more respectful I mean, I don't think we get as many bacon jokes from mainstream journalists as we used to. And I, I think, you know, if it's an event or a demo, I, I I don't see people asking, you know, will there be naked girls there like they used to? Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, so, yeah, I, I, I would say I, I, I like to say we get a very high class of rejection now. It's not just low level newspaper editors who are rejecting us. It is top producers at very top outlets who are telling us no. And I think that's really good that's good progress. Yeah. And Keisha, I imagine there's probably more of an appetite for relationship building with, with these editors and, um, and these, these folks with you who are, you know, is at the sort of forefront of all, a lot of these stories and groups. Um, are you finding that? Are you finding that they're, they, they are, are people phoning you up ever any at, at all? Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you have a great relationship with somebody, they get laid off. <laughs> yeah 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 which go, comes back to that whole idea of of okay we'll we'll get into that in a second but the way that we need to spoon feed um media editors these days um okay jess what about you um what ha- have you seen shift what's the evidence for you 
I definitely have seen a big change when I started writing 10 years ago, writing about animal issues exclusively, I think maybe six or seven years ago, I used to have to do a lot more begging. I was definitely doing a lot more searching for ideas, lots more research, whereas now they're kind of all coming to me, which is good and bad. It also means that things are sort of getting worse in a lot of ways, but also that there's so much more coverage of things for me, say, specifically as an opinion writer on one end, to have lots of things to talk about. Now I can't even really keep up with the amount of things I can go to editors with that I believe are timely. Mm -hmm. And there's also a difference in the amount of stuff that is being accepted. I used to get rejected a lot more and now I almost never do. I think I've also learned to hone my ability to know what's timely and what editors will actually care about. So there's that part of it. But I think there's two reasons for this. And one of them, as I'll often say, is activists doing things doing things for me to write about, doing mm-hmm. things for media to cover. So the fact that we've had activists like Direct Action Everywhere, um, like even undercover investigators that are working with animal justice, going on to farms, live streaming indisputable evidence through social media that the public can see that cannot be talked about being edited or doctored. Those are, are things that make news. Those are things that we can write about, and those are things that are going to enrage the public. So activists having smartphones and being able to live stream through social media has has been a game changer for sure. Mm. Also, um, uh, publications like Sentient Media, like Planet Friendly News, advocacy publications, We Animals Media, who are pushing these narratives into more public spaces. Sentient Media does amazing things with Google words and Google searches that wasn't being done before. So that when people are researching issues, these things pop up first. Mm -hmm. So those things combined, I think are really changing the landscape of media coverage for animal issues on a really broad scale. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that we have these animal advocacy media organizations. Jenny, can you explain a little bit more about Sentient Media and sort of uh, what the mission is at Sentient Media? Well, we have a new mission. (laughs) Glad you asked. Yeah, Um, me too. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we've we've been really like re, re, you know, working and thinking about our our strategy a lot, just like since I've join but um our our goal is to shift the conversation around animal agriculture um that's that's our stated mission um we and i think in in a way because there is more there is at least some space for for coverage of these issues in mainstream outlets um we're kind of I think that's in a way part of why we're sort of like okay well what is our you know what should we be doing at sentia media um, and what we're, what we're kind of landing, a lot of what we do are these explainers, um, that, you know, some of it is SEO driven and we're also working on these kind of like short explainers for people, just anybody who's basically the idea is if you're, you know, curious about these topics or Googling, you may be like new to, to, to the issues that you'll just find something that's very factual, fact checked, um, and, you know, le- at least from the way I edit, like leading with facts, you know, not kind of what Wayne was talking about in this like sub stack. I don't know if we mentioned it yet um, since we let everyone in, but but I agree with everything he's he's saying, you know, they're basically just like leading with the facts. There's, you know, you don't really need to sort of embellish with emotions because you've got enough there. So that's, that's kind of what we do with our explainers. And then we still do kind of the original investigations. We're ramping up quarterly investigations. Um, and the idea for for our, at least our idea for that is things that maybe wouldn't get covered elsewhere. We will, you know, try to have a home for it and coverage of science, um, like animal behavioral science, climate science, you know, all of these kind of like issues, these areas, I think where like, there's an overlap between, you know, like, like environmental impacts and animal impacts where we're trying to cover that kind of research. Um, so yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And our, our, our strategy is really actually to get our coverage into mainstream media in some way, you know, whether it's just being linked to in an article or being retweeted by another outlet. That's kind of our our plan for the next three years is is trying to basically get more of these issues um, covered and get the mainstream media to be paying attention. Mm, so almost like uh, you're you're a, a seed creating seeds for for mainstream media. Yeah, yeah. And we're trying to be, we, you know, the biggest thing for us is like in the short term is just like making sure everything's as 
credible as possible so that it's not discounted as, you know, just being sort of hyperbolic or emotional, that it's just facts and it's fact checked and all the sources are linked um, so that so that journalists who look at it, you know, they might like we, we I think sort of bias at this point is like everyone's biased, but um, and I think a lot of journalists are, are coming to agree with that, you know, wherever they work. But so, you know, we have no problem saying we want we're, you know, we're exposing impacts of animal agriculture, but we're we're just putting the facts out there. So, it, you know, it's and it's fact checked. And so um, and, and journalists who come and whether it's a journalist or someone who's just new to the issues who wants to read about it, they'll be able to you know, we have all our sources there. So there's no question that it's accurate. Amazing. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, and so, okay, what animal uh, related issues and stories would you say have been successful in getting good media coverage and why? So before we, you know, start poking at what's wrong, what are we doing wrong as a movement? Let's really acknowledge and try to learn from what are some of the issues and stories that have been getting some good ink. Um, Keisha, let's start with you. What would you say is working out there? What are what's an example or an exa couple of examples? I, I mean, obviously, it's good to uh, Jessica mentioned things being timely. So tying into a specific issue going on, I mean, COVID presented a lot of opportunities um, for us to to get some some awareness out there. So it's good to tie to current events like COVID. I think we can do that pretty well. Fortunately and unfortunately, because because of the scope of the problem and all of the, the many fingers that it has, there is a lot to draw in there. Um, uh, we had a, a story um, not too long ago with a, a, an egg farm in Iowa that was depopulating, and so they were gassing 100,000 uh, animals and um, a thousand of them were rescued and and made it to sanctuary in Northern California at Animal Place. And so that was that got a lot of coverage. I think anytime you put animals on a private plane, um, the, the media tends to respond to that. What, you know, elephants, lions, chickens, any charter a plane, that'll <laughs> that'll get news coverage. That'll that'll help. I promise. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, but but you know, we we got to talk about what was going on uh, during the pandemic and how farms were killing millions of animals and blah blah blah, um, and and kind of in a related note, um, I, I think in general sanctuaries do a really good job of giving the public these happy stories about the random survivors of these exploitative industries, and then giving the public the context so that they can understand the issues. So I, I I would always say, you know, look look to sanctuaries for how they're presenting uh, some of these rescue stories. They they do a nice job of pulling it all together and occasionally making it timely and all of that. So I, I give sanctuaries a lot of credit for, mm. for that. Yeah, sanctuaries are amazing. It can be amazing ambassadors for our movement. Um, Wayne, you landed in the middle of one of the most successful sort of media wins for our movement this year, this past year. So tell us a little bit about that. And what do you think was the secret sauce that that brought that all together? Yeah, you know, one of my favorite authors, Daniel Coyle, uh, once provided this advice in, in, a, in a book he wrote on storytelling. And he, and he said this, that if you want to tell a good story, you need a big challenge. And the bigger the challenge, the better the story. And I think the reason the Smithfield trial was a great story was because there was enormous amount at stake. I went into that case facing potentially 60 years in prison. By the time we got to trial, it dropped down to only 10 years, but that is terrifying. And the notion to most people that someone could face 10 years in prison for giving aid to two sick and dying piglets was incredibly interesting to many, many people across the nation and world, even folks who had no interest in animal rights. It was also something people could get behind, even if they were not vegans, because they could say to themselves, look, I'm not a vegetarian or vegan, but the idea that the FBI should be spending a dozen agents across the nation chasing after piglets and try to send this guy to prison for a decade or more was something that felt safe to endorse, even though I personally was not a vegan or vegetarian. But Criminal cases and personal risk aren't the only way to create great challenges. And another one of the best stories that's been written over the last five years is about Leah Garces and Craig Watts. And if you don't know that story, you should read the Nick Kristoff column on the relationship that developed between the two of them. But that was challenging for two reasons. One, it's a story about a poultry farmer who turns against the industry. 
And that is a great challenge. You know, the year you have this contract farmer whose entire economic livelihood depends on the approval and support of Purdue Foods, one of the biggest poultry companies in the world. And he comes out and calls them out and says, this is a corrupt, abusive, and dangerous industry. That is incredibly challenging. It's one of the reasons Nick Kristoff was willing to write that piece. But the other thing that was really interesting about this piece that was extraordinary challenge, and I give all the credit in the world to Leah for this, is the idea that Leah would form a friendship and a relationship with this factory farmer who would then convert his farm to a mushroom farm. I mean, how many of us have tried to get like our family members even to join us for a vegan holiday, it's right? And Leah convinces this guy who's a poultry farmer to shift to a plant-based farm. That is an extraordinary challenge to overcome. It's one of the reasons the New York Times came knocking when she pitched the story. So my advice to everyone is good stories are the same on social media and movies or in the mainstream media. At the end of the day, they need to have a great challenge. And the bigger the challenge, the better the story. Mm. It, can I just yeah. add that? Please, Jenny. It, it's just funny because that reminds me that I covered that when I was a contributor still at Forbes mm. because, and I wasn't vegan then, and I wasn't particularly covering animal issues at all. I was more covering climate, but I did find it super fascinating that these chicken farmers were going to like, we're yeah, speaking out against the industry and we're partnering with vegans that seemed compelling and also like how are they going to convert chicken barns and it seemed <laughs> like you know kind of a huge challenge and it is kind of a challenge and so all that stuff was like I and you know in, in some ways it is as simple especially if you're you know yeah if you're pitching editors or if you're pitching you know a freelancer it's like if you can hook them like I wanted to know more really I mean it's as simple as that like I wasn't necessarily for as much as I love evidence and data and that's all I really care about at the end of the day it was kind of like I would like to talk to these chicken farmers you know who let vegans onto their property and film and all this stuff so it's, it's, it's curiosity a really good point. you were yeah. really like your curiosity got totally sparked yeah, yeah yep. I love it so I, yeah go I ahead Kasia I wanted to say that that our experience with the 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 with Anita Kreins and her pig trial was very mm -hmm. similar. You know, people could not believe this was happening to this poor part-time professor. You know, um, but uh, but but one thing that these pieces have in common is that they're human-centered narratives. Mm -hmm. They're not animal-centered narratives, yeah. and. Not that there's anything wrong with that, because sometimes we need to center the humans in the stories, um, like I, everything I, else in the world. But we, right. but yes, it's but it's, I, it's we're, I, but we're I wish humans. there were. I wish there were uh, other ways as well than mm -hmm. than centering the humans' experience. But so, I mean, Keisha, such a good point because, um, I mean, yes, I think we all care about animals, but we care about humans. I mean, we're, we're humans reporting on humans and, um, and it's a really important piece to remember how do we center, you know, the humans in a story um, as a gateway, as a gateway to be able to share the information of the animals. Yes, Jess. I, I was just going to say that that mm -hmm. mine is all about gateways. That that, mm -hmm. that because we're selfish as a species, I have found that over the last several years, the most successful thing that I've been able to pitch and write about more than anything else, um, particularly here in Canada, but, but beyond, and still to this day, I just co-authored a piece with Jen Arden today that's going into the newspaper. I'm not going to tell you where it's a surprise, that's but it's about the horse meat industry because they are a gateway animal that people who aren't vegan care so much about. So I've been able to talk about the advocacy efforts, the grassroots efforts. I've been able to talk about the legal challenges. I've been able to talk about the cultural issues, um, the history of it, the future of it, the political issues, the liberal government still not performing on their promises. There's so many facets to it. And the reason why is because people love horses. But the good thing about a story like this is we can center the animals, we can enrage the public, but we can also then use it to talk about speciesism. So that's, to me, the ultimate situation is being able to have something that publications like the Globe and Mail are going to let me write about not once, but now twice, and then be able to carry on conversations about, but wait a minute, what are we talking about here? We're talking about slaughtering animals that are grown on feedlots for the specific purpose of meat. Why does this upset you so much? Uh, so being able to lead with this gateway animal has been one of the best strategies for me particularly and I think for activists too because look it ended up on 
a campaign uh, promise for the liberal government, and then they were elected. We're still working on fulfilling that, but it was a, one, I think, one of the only grassroots activists concerning animals that we've ever seen put on a, a, a campaign platform before, federally. Mm, great point, Jess. Great point. Um, so I, 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 again, you've brought up some really important points, but I, I want to just sort of, again, get a bit of a bird's eye view here um, that as a movement, it seems like we're still falling short uh, or just plain getting it wrong in terms of getting this you know, animal issues front and center in the media. Um, and, and again, I, we know that there's other factors and there's media bias and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to what we're doing, you know, the people here are doing, um, what do you think we need to change most about our approach? Um, I'm going to start with you, Jenny, on this one. Because you already um, sort of started to talk about it. You started to talk about facts and, you know, and yeah. hyperbole, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, well, again, you know, it depends on like who you're pitching, of course. Like, I think, you know, and I mean, I'm a science writer. I, you know, I'd written a couple of times for Vox's Future Perfect section. And I think, you know, my, I, my brain works very much the same way as the editors there. And it's just sort of like, you know, what are, what are the points? What's the analysis? Um, and when I get, when I would get pitches as a freelancer or when I get them now, I just kind of want to know the underlying facts. If there's new study, if there's new research, um, you know, and, and sometimes I get things that are like, someone's trying to sort of shoehorn in, um, uh, an impact to make, to, to fit sort of like, because there's a tension on, I'll just say like, it wasn't about COVID-19, it was about climate impacts actually, but it's like, don't like, there's just lead with what is already bad enough, you know? Like, I think that's kind of the most important thing. Like there's plenty of facts out there. You don't have to kind of like twist it into fit into this narrative of what you think people are looking for. Because if you send that to someone who has any experience kind of covering the science and it's not accurate. It's just like immediately a red flag for me. So, I mean, I think that's kind of like the biggest thing that drives me nuts. Um, yeah, I mean, of course though, it just like, it, it does depend on who you're pitching. Like, I think what Wayne's saying about storytelling is definitely true. Um, you know, I wrote more for these outlets where I'm like, like, give me the report and the data and the infographic and that kind of thing, but that's not every place, of course. So it just kind of, it depends. Um, and I, and I really think more and more these days in terms of like different sort of, um, silos and buckets and outlets and like, we're all divided up and where we get our information and like, you know, the person on Instagram looking for more like cute science story, cute animal stories versus, you know, somebody looking on Reddit, who's maybe, you know, arguing about numbers or something like that. So like, that's kind of how my brain thinks about all these different silos these days. But um, like, I, there isn't just like one audience basically. So think about like the outlet and who you're and, and what they and their readers and like what they what their readers want, which isn't going to be the same for everybody. Mm. Just to make your job more difficult, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I would, I would jump in. I would jump in on that um, just quickly. Like I, I use this sort of, I don't, I don't think I've told anybody this before, but I, I use this sort of method for how to pitch using specific language, focusing on specific points of a story. Um, of course, like we're all talking about here, leading with facts, not over exaggerating. That's kind of a blanket thing. Sometimes you can take more liberties with different places. So for example, this is just between all of us here that, so let's say for the Globe and Mail, um, you know, that I would, I would pitch it in a way where I would think I'm having, um, I'm trying to convince my very well-educated aunt who isn't vegan. That's who I write to when I pitch the Globe Mail. If I pitch it to the Toronto Star, it's maybe my little bit more liberal uncle who likes a Beyond Burger. So, you know, like I have these different versions and ways of speaking to publications and then subsequently their audience, if I then get the gig, um, that is kind of based on who you know in real life because we're talking to people who are us. We're talking yeah. to people who are not vegan, who are not necessarily up to, you know, what we know about animal rights and ha don't have come from our baseline perspective. So you have to know your audience and you have to know your editor, first of all. 
Mm, I love that, Jess. In in marketing, they call those like marketing avatars and and your ideal customer, you know. And so that's what you're doing for each media outlet is is what's what's their ideal customer. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, Wayne, what do you think we are getting wrong? It, Wayne actually wrote an incredible um, article, quite, uh, incredible blog on his uh, his blog, Simple Heart. Is it Simple Heart? Heart Hearts. Simple Did I get it right? Okay. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Kirsten's going to put it in the chat, and I I really recommend everybody read this. Why the media usually ignores animal rights. Um, and this is uh, Wayne does an amazing blog here. Um, so Wayne, give us uh, give us a few of, of your takes on what we're doing wrong here as 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 a movement. Yeah, I mean, I what I say in the blog is there are kind of a, a few things we do wrong. One is we use propaganda too much. We've talked about that. Uh, one is we, uh, you know, kind of don't realize that there's a cognitive bias that the journalists have, and we're not reading our audience, which Jessica just mentioned, which I agree with 100%. And just to understand the importance of cognitive biases, which we all have, just remember how you feel when you're doing outreach and someone tells you, oh, did you know animal agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to climate change and how excited you get and how happy you are that someone's saying things that you believe in and that are in the tone and the, the framing and kind of the sort of language that you respect and love. And that's kind of what you want to do for the journals. Use the tone and framing and language that they love. But one thing I didn't mention in the blog that I think is pretty important and is kind of self-evident, but I feel like animal rights activists almost always miss, and I'm meaning even large organizations, including ours, is the news has to be new, right? If you're making the same pitch you made six months ago, yeah. you're not going to get any stories. And too often, animal rights activists will just say like, Oh, someone else got a coverage in the New York Times because of an undercover investigation of gestation crates and pig farms. Let me go pitch the New York Times on gestation crates and pig farms. It's like, no, 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 that's not going to work. They already published that story and the readers already read that story and the editors and the journalists are all going to be bored of that story. And when we reach the point where we're as powerful as Black Lives Matter and everyone in the country is only talking about our issue, then maybe we can get away with sending derivative pitches. But we're not there yet. We're very, very marginal. And we have to make every single pitch personalized and distinct and unique. And too often, I think animal rights actors don't do that. We're just taking templates and thinking, oh, they published a story on X. Let me send them another story on X. It is useful to look at what they previously published and see what they're interested in. But you've always got to have a new angle. If you don't have a new angle, keep working on your pitch or just drop the story because you don't actually have a story if you can't create a new angle for journalists. Or, yeah, or even yeah. Go ahead, when, Jess. when they don't, I get approached by so many advocates and activists who have come upon something really shocking, really awful, and they come to me really needing and wanting my help. And it's difficult for me to often say, I can't do anything about this. You need it. Mm-hmm. You need it to make news first, especially if you're mm-hmm. looking to, to write an opinion piece. I can't just pull it out of nowhere, right? It has to be something that, that the public nationally, almost always, sometimes regionally is okay has already been made aware of and is already kind of upset about then we can have more of a media conversation about it uh, it's it's a difficult position that i'm in that so often there's really great stories out there but i often have to push people on to you know sort of regional reporters and hope that it picks up steam mm-hmm. can i just say something real quick about that absolutely that is so 100 percent true and the opinion pieces are in many ways the best pieces because this is the place where we can make our most persuasive case for animal rights so i think what jessica scott reed is doing is so so important but 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 and, and for example my new york times op that there is zero chance they published that if not for the fact that the right. news desk had published a report a few days early if andrew jacobs doesn't write a story about the trial and you know the guardian and the intercept don't write about the trial we don't get that op-ed in the new york times and we don't get a chance to go to legislators go to donors go to influential people and corporations and say look at this opinion piece that says there will come a day when we no longer slaughter animals for food. It was because the news led first. So I'm 100 percent in agreement with that. Yeah, and that's an important piece um, to for for folks in the Animal Justice Academy to remember because we actually in our um, in our course we do a module. Jessica leads a module on uh, how to write op eds, or how to pitch op eds, and also letters to the editor. And um, and and that is it is dependent. If you're wanting to do an op ed, you need to jump on the back of, of an, a news story. That's that's just the way op eds work. Um, or at least uh, something very topical or something very big in action that's happening. So, um, Keja, I didn't, we didn't get your input on what are we doing wrong? 
what are, what would you, what do you want to add to this, this pile of wrongness? I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of organizations do make mistakes with their language and, and Wayne's piece that everyone should read. We'll just say that for the fourth time. Everyone should read that. Um, you, you know, does, does, it, uh, does explain that pretty well, I, but I, I, I think we can be persuasive while we're being factual. And I actually think that that is sort of the genius of writing for press or the art of it is to be both at the same time. And 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 I, that does certainly take practice. Um, Jenny's right. I think we tend to make things too complicated or at least appear too complicated. You know, journalists do not generally have time to read a long email with tons of background information and 27 links and a Dropbox. Um, you know, like, like I'm and I'm guilty of that myself a little bit because my instinct is to be thorough, but it doesn't matter because even when I say, uh, you know, the farm is in Dodge City, they're still going to come back to me and say, and where's the farm? Because, you know, I've tried to front load too much shit in there, at, 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 you know, um, and honestly, I, I think we, I, I think our biggest problem, and this goes back decades, is we've just used sensationalism and stunts uh, for too long, and it hasn't worked, and if it had worked, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, the, the, particularly among organizations who I think may be may feel like they're competing for mindshare and donations. There seems to be this feeling that we constantly have to raise the stakes. We have to up the ante. We have to have even more shocking visuals and we need more blood and we need more dead animal bodies. And you know somehow this is gonna get the media attention that we're looking for. Um, I, I think that's a, a kind of a flaw in our logic, but if I go back to what I sort of led with, which is us feeling like we're entitled to media coverage for our issues, I think we also have to ask, what is the media coverage accomplishing for us? How are hearts and minds being changed by this coverage? And I, I think media can really backfire in a heartbeat if we're not doing well, if we're not doing a good job. So so I, that was like an all over the map answer, but you know, everybody was right. And then plus, I, I think that's another thing that we've been doing wrong. Yeah, is all is all press good press when it comes to animal rights issues, right? And I, I don't think that that's the case. I feel like some of the time I'm having to counteract things that have been done. Mm -hmm. And like I always tell, you know, new writers is it's bad enough. It's already bad enough. It looks bad enough. It sounds bad enough. The facts are bad enough. Just we don't let, have to embellish. We don't tell the story and show the evidence. It looks bad enough because the minute you're found to be overdoing it, you're discredited. Editors don't want to hear from you. Audiences, oh, that's a vegan, and that's it. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to jump off uh, this with a question from uh, one of our uh, participants here. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost your name, but um, the they said, hi, I am the media coordinator with Animal Rebellion in the UK. Congratulations, Animal Rebellion. Um, so much good work. And we have found a hundredfold media bias towards shock factor actions versus the liberation style actions um, mm -hmm. that really resonate with our volunteers and base. I am wondering if the panel has any thoughts regarding controversial tactics, such as pouring milk in high-end supermarkets, um, that start a big public conversation, loads of live interviews, but make us more hated amongst vegans versus actions that save a small number of animals with much less reach. Um, yeah. That's a tough question. Yeah, it is a tough question. I mean, I guess the answer is depends. <laughs> <laughs> um anybody anybody want to field this i mean i would fight the hypothetical because I, I think dxc has probably gotten more media coverage than any i mean i i certainly i won't say more but we've gotten enormous amount of media coverage over the last 10 years mm -hmm. using both shock tactics and rescues of a few individuals and by far the biggest stories have been rescues of a few individuals again you look at glenn greenwald because this is a guy who broke the edward snowden story and his article about the rescue of lynn and lizzie was read by more people than any article he's ever written. This is what he told me. Yeah. 130,000 shares on Facebook alone. Ezra Klein shared it on Twitter. I got 10,000 shares. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I just don't think that's correct. If you're telling the story in the right way, if all you're doing is, oh, we rescued an animal, of course, that's not going to get good media coverage. But if you tell a story with a challenge behind it, right, we're rescuing an animal from the largest factory farm in the nation. We're facing prosecution by the FBI and we're still not giving up. We're still going back and rescuing more animals despite this. Then the rescue of individual animals is something that's going to motivate the base and attract media coverage. And in my trial is another example of that. So I, I would fight the hypothetical on that and ask someone to actually go back and look at the data because I'm going to get real here. Uh, I, I actually don't like a lot of the media attention even DXC gets. DXC is a diverse grassroots platform. I'm not calling the shots. A lot of people do stuff that I think is generating headlines that are probably counterproductive. One thing I will say about that though, is even when activists are generating counterproductive headlines, we should be working together and not airing out dirty laundry in the media. We should be talking to each other internally and understanding that some people are just gonna have a different theory of change and that's okay, you know? So, but, but I would fight that hypothetical a little bit. Mm, yeah. So, so there, the old adage, all, all media is good media. It does not apply necessarily. You're saying, Do, would, would all of you agree that, that there is bad media? I agree. Yeah. I, I've learned, I've learned that I actually don't know. I have learned that when it comes to trying to dictate what works and what doesn't work, when I say in the media what I think works or doesn't work, I'm usually wrong. <laughs> because and I, let me let me put a caveat though. I, I think it depends on what your goal is. That's a good point. That's a good point. Like I, what is, I have what the, is the goal couple, behind getting that media attention? The whole, so, if the whole point is to change hearts and minds. If the whole point is to motivate people to rethink their choices, um, I know that I know that in the last like couple of months, I have been asked so many times, "Oh, are you going to go throw some soup on a painting?" Like many times, in such a dismissive way that I think, is that person even going to read what I write, no matter where I put it? You know, like that, I, I worry about that, but I, I am not, I, I do not know. And I'm not going to say that I do. <laughs> I just want to like throw out one wrinkle that just occurred to me also is that, um, you know, like thing, the things that the media is, the media, I mean, of course it's like way more complicated, but um, that what we're paying attention, you know, we're all, we're fickle. The media is just like us, we're fickle. And so like, you know, a story idea might get rejected all over the place. And then six months later, everyone's like, oh, wait, I, no one's covering this. Like, let's let's pay attention again. So I do think that there is like, you have to be kind of, um, you know, there's no like, in some ways there aren't like fixed rules, I think about like what's off limits, what's, you know, what, what what's sure. to be covered. Yeah. I mean, there the uh, milk pouring out thing, yes, it, it irritate, to, irritated a lot of people, but how many conversations did you have with people close to you? about it and then you can take the initiative to share a deeper sort of experience of of what they're trying to get to i mean there's that that point too right media media is a starting point of conversations yeah that's the whole point yeah yeah um okay can i, so, can I add one thing about yeah, that media? absolutely Wayne. i think I, I actually agree a lot with what jessica said and that i think none of us really know what's going to work and that's why it's important not to air out our dirty laundry and have strategic conversations behind the scenes but the one exception I'd make, and this is probably the only exception to something that I'm pretty sure is bad media, is anything that even portrays animal rights activists as violent. And mm -hmm. I say this as someone who has been portrayed as violent by the media. And I think that is almost always bad media and we should do our best to always be perceived as nonviolent, peaceful and having moral high ground. That's true even when you're doing radical actions. And I think it's even more important when you're doing radical actions that you really, really focus on how you can do those radical actions and still be portrayed as nonviolent. I totally, I totally agree, and I know that in my work, my ability to to tell a narrative and and characterize activists, even those walking onto farms, which some people think is inherently violent, even if done peacefully, for me to be able to write a story about activists covered in head snow bio gear, having peace signs, bringing flowers, providing vegan treats to the farm staff. I mean, I know that might be a bit over the top, but the, the, my ability to write it that way allows the story to unfold very differently. And I think really can bring in far more readers and, and bring in more sympathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I mean, we are animal activists are generally regarded as these extremists. So the more that we can make them 
relatable, accessible, um, you know, and the, yeah, the moment violence happens, uh, we lose that on so many levels. Although Debbie uh, did ask, need to define violence in some cases. So uh, Wayne, when you say violence, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, I got this answered from a professor at Harvard, Erica Chenoweth, many years ago because oh, yeah. she's done the research on violence and nonviolence, And I really encourage everyone to read her book, Why Civil Disobedience, or I should say, Why Civil Resistance Works and some of her literature. Her literature is amazing. And it's really important, not just for activism, but for media, because a lot of what she writes about is perception. And what she told me was, it actually doesn't matter what the exact content of the action is. It's really about the perception and the battle over framing. So whatever action you're taking, even if it is a nonviolent action, I'll give you an example. One of the reasons Occupy Wall Street in the United States fell apart was because there were a number of actions around the country that were actually nonviolent actions, but were perceived by large majorities of Americans as violent. And an example that she gave to me was burning the American flag. It's just a piece of cloth. It's not doing any particular harm to anyone other than maybe the person burning it might burn themselves, it might breathe in some fumes. And so you might think, you know, totally nonviolent action. But because, for those of you who know Americans, Americans love their flag. <laughs> And they felt personally violated and threatened. They thought you're burning the flag today, you're gonna to burn down Capitol building next, or you're going to you know, bomb a military installation next. And that might be a paranoid and unreasonable reaction, but we have to be able to predict people's reactions. And we need to be able to predict how the industry is gonna portray mm. our actions in a way that will ensure that the people of this country do not see our actions as violent. So it really is about the perceptions of the audience we're trying to change. Now that audience might be different for different actions. Sometimes you're trying to persuade corporations. Sometimes you're trying to persuade legislators. Sometimes you're trying to persuade the ordinary Jane or Joe on the street. But whoever your audience is, if they can, if, if your actions can be caricatured even to portray you as violent successfully, that's a problem for the action. Mm -hmm. I think I, that's I, why I had activists the... walking onto farms was such a debatable thing. I, I get into this with uh, any any time an animal exploiter like a farm owner is you know is mentioned in a in the news you know they they immediately go back and tell everyone that you know the vegans and animal rights activists were calling them and making death threats so mm -hmm. I, I honestly like even if we're completely nonviolent and nobody thinks what we're doing is violent they're gonna lie anyway I mean, come on, are they really getting death threats? Are people really going to their kids' bus stop and driving by? Come on, son. Mm -hmm. Like them saying that walking onto farms is like walking into my home. My children were out in the yard. No, they weren't. You do not live beside a pig barn so much that you're so close that activists walking on with flowers and peace signs is, is <laughs> your children. I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so here's a question. I wanna, I wanna expand a little bit on what Jenny said earlier. Um, is there something we need to change about our narrative or the language we use that'll kind of help to melt the, the media chill a little bit? Is there any, like, lang is there language stuff that we need to, to watch? For sure. Yeah, Jess? Well, for sure. I think we've said it a, a few times here, lead mm -hmm. with facts. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even when I'm writing in the uh, opinion section, you know, I do both reporting and, and opinion writing, but in the opinion section, they are waiting for me to sound crazy, right? The minute that the headline talks about anything regarding animal rights or veganism or food systems or and even animal welfare, they're waiting for me and waiting for the writing to be dismissed, right? So that they can easily dismiss it. So don't give them a reason. To easily dismiss it, lead with things that are going to compel the average reader to keep reading and to reconsider their own thoughts. If you give them any reason whatsoever to, oh, crazy vegan, then they're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, I mean, uh, a lot of us that are in this movement pitching these stories, we're very passionate. I mean, a lot of us are, most of us are in it because of the animals. And so there is a lot of emotion. Um, so are we, like, we basically have to put our emotion aside or we just have to be able to see the situation through the eyes of somebody who doesn't, hasn't seen everything we've seen channel it channel it right channel that passion into speaking to your educated aunt who doesn't know anything about veganism mm. anybody else want to say anything about this this topic i'm just thinking because we wayne start, started with storytelling and that is actually like a you know a passion of mine so i think you know part of it's not that like emotion is 
that, but I think, you know, like the, the, the big rule of storytelling is show, don't tell. And so I do get a lot of like pitches that are just like, um, I'm going to tell you why the food system's bad. Why this is like, it's like, well, okay. Like, and, and I can be like, agree with you, but like you showed you what you're telling me what you're going to do, or you're telling me these things without just like showing me the story, the facts, whatever it is. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's just like, you don't necessarily have to like, you know, be a, compl- like a, a robot when you pitch, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you can use narrative, but I think it's just like, to be effective, it needs to sort of, it, you know, it, it just needs to sort of like paint a picture with those, those facts, I guess. Like it needs to, to, to be less about like this. Yeah. I'm already, I'm already doing too much telling. Like I've made mm. my point. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I love that. Jenny, that. That's show. the more effective way to do it. Show, don't tell like yeah. examples, anecdotes, yeah. you know, all of that sort of thing. They, they speak. Yeah. Kasia. Can I, can I make, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I'll be fast, just to, just to also state the obvious. I mean, you know, yes, be factual, but, uh, but also, you know, use AP style, do the inverted pyramid. Please, you know, follow the rules too. Like, Can you explain that a little bit more, Keisha, for those that- People yeah. need to do that because they need to learn it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Wayne. I will just say, I mean, one thing that- um, my friend Lauren Gazzol told me many years ago, who's an amazing activist and now works for Animal Outlook, is that to journalists, you're kind of like a salesperson who gives them a cold call. And we've all had salespeople who are clearly trying to pitch us. And the good salespeople don't actually appear like they're pitching us, right? That's, that's the key thing. The more you feel like someone's trying to sell you something, the more you're like, I don't want to buy what you have to sell me. It's, you're clearly just kind of manipulating things and trying to manipulate me to do this thing that you want me to do. And, but the best salespeople are, are people like your friends. Like when your friend tells you, hey, you should really kind of try this new product. Like there's a great new burger at this restaurant, you know, and you know, it's authentic. It, it's coming from a good place and it feels real in a way that like someone cold calling you as a sales pitch does not. And this is part of the reason relationships are important because when you develop relationships with journalists, they feel less like you're just some random person trying to sell them or something, but also just, when you're thinking about emotion and authenticity and whether to lead with facts or, or, or some sort of propaganda, I mean, to the extent it sounds like propaganda, the person you're pitching, it's not going to work. So it really is pretty distinct. So like when I'm pitching to someone like Jessica Scott Reed or Marina Balatnikova, I know I can pitch differently and with more emotion perhaps and more kind of quote unquote exaggeration than if I'm cold pitching some science journalist at the New York Times or the Washington Post. But the key thing is just remember how you feel when a salesperson calls you cold and try to avoid that in whatever way you can. Can we get into just a little bit of nitty gritty because we have a lot of folks here uh, who have organizations or campaigns or events that they're trying to get media out for. Um, Do you have any tips for, you know, writing press releases? Do we keep it short? Um, You know, like what are some of the things you've learned about around press releases? Keisha, let you, I mean, you, you've probably written a thousand. So um, what are some of the keys that you found? Uh, well, I, I would say because you mentioned events, but you know, also know the difference, you know when to use a press release and know when to use the media alert. Mm-hmm. Um, just the formatting is different. And again, you can Google that. It's really widely available. On In fact, I hope everybody's taking notes. Media alert format. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, know when to, to know to do, I have kind of a specific presentation about this, but that's a uh, uh, no means no. And um, if you get crickets, that's also that also means no. Um, uh, honestly, like when it comes to this, I think a lot of us have been trained that honestly everything needs a press release. And I, I would say, you know, pitch more, press release less. Mm-hmm. Um, press releases are really important because they are really valuable for um, preserving an archive of your organization and your accomplishments. And that's sort of your of the official record of your organization. And they're super helpful for anybody who is doing research about you, particularly members of the media. They're going to go right for that press release section on your website. Um, so definitely write them. But for members of the media, and I'm, I'm sure Jenny will uh, agree that as soon as one lands in your inbox, you know that every single one of your competitors got it and every single one of your colleagues got it. Um, and it almost is, you know, not, not worth it at that point, but 
you know, do, do go ahead and, and, and continue to do that. Um, I would say, especially for those of you working, you know, locally with events or vigils or whatever, um, don't forget the, gen yes, know the audience, know the outlets and everything, but don't forget the generic ones like the info ad and the tips at. Um, honestly, we have um, a lot of, um, a lot of producers who say, hey, could you make sure you send this to, you know, info at so that all the producers get, will see it. Um, I, I find people sometimes forget that when we're all doing our research on who to pitch, like, don't, don't forget those guys too. Don't forget the, the, the main mailboxes, um, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, inverted pyramid AP style or whatever it is you people use in Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what about, uh, Wayne, you, uh, as a head of, of organizations have probably sent out a lot of, um, press releases. Um, what has been, um, what have you found successful for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree so much with what Casey had just said, I, I think press releases are increasingly impotent. <laughs> mm -hmm. They can generate some kind of local headlines by some beat writer who's just going to write something about a demonstration that happened just recently or happens locally. But the main value of that, honestly, because just local media is dying. So it's just mm -hmm. not getting a lot of eyeball, eyeballs. It's not going to get a lot of mobilization or support. It's mainly just for social proof. You can send it to your own activists and say, look, we got covered. And that's awesome. That's really, really important for your actors to feel like people are paying attention, even if it's a small local media. But before the bigger publications and, and the most high impact publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, there's not even a point in sending a press release to them if you're trying to get them to cover it. I mean, unless it really is. I mean, we haven't gotten any story in animal rights, maybe history that's gotten to the point where just a template press release you can send to the New York Times and they cover it. All of our successful pitches are highly personalized pitches based on an understanding of what that specific journalist writes about. Mm -hmm. And figuring out how to do that is just as important as a press release. And that's gotta be super concise. It's gotta be a headline that they can understand that gets right to the point, a first sentence that's absolutely crucial. And it's gotta be short. <laughs> if it's 13 paragraphs, even a journalist who likes you and knows you, like an Andrew Jacobs or an Andy Greenberg at Wired, they're just not gonna have time to read it and they won't. And all of us have got an email from someone we like. We're all overloaded. And you got some friend who sends you a 13 paragraph email and you think, oh, I really want to read this. And then six I'll months later, you still haven't read it. Yeah, I'll <laughs> save that for later. And we never read it, you know, even if you kind of want to. But That's if you can right. get right to the point and explain how this is an opportunity, this is not an ask, but an opportunity. This is something that you've already written about. This is kind of fuel for you. You already care about this issue to some degree. And this is your chance to write about something that you find interesting, you're going to enjoy, and it's going to help your profession and career. Just get right to that very, very quickly. Mm, so yeah, so we're it's all about the it's all about the individual pitches. And and so for those that are they have a story that they're like, this is a juicy story. Um, you would recommend sort of looking for a journalist that maybe has some background in this or at least has covered something um you know, uh, parallel to it and actually, you know, uh, sending them an email that is really personal to their work, what they do and their style. Is that, am I getting it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so um, let, I want to do a little brainstorming here. Um, at Animal Justice, we've really noticed it's getting much harder to get attention for investigation videos. And, and that's a big problem because exposing folks to the cruelty that happens behind the closed doors of, of our, you know, is one of our biggest tools of the movement. Um, so what, why do you think the footage isn't getting as much attention as it once did? Probably I'm going to say, set, you know, there's a, there's been a lot. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we need to adapt around this? Jenny. This is, like, this is what I was thinking about with the sort of um, this exact topic with the sort of fickleness of media, because we've been talking internally about new investigations to do. And, you know, we had the suggestion to do, um, I guess it wasn't necessarily internal, it wasn't necessarily videos, but but sort of like slaughterhouse inspections. And I was sort of like, well, yes, that got a lot of attention. Like I forgot when, 2015 or 2016, but it's like once there's been a spate of those now, I mean it's it's so horrible because it's sort of like it's true that it's still happening, but the reality is when it's been covered a ton of times, they don't know people do outlets do not want to cover it again like they need some new horrible wrinkle um it, it's just the reality like there needs to be some sort of new you know take on it to a certain extent 
Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I don't. Ventilation shutdown was the perfect new in to right. talk animal death on yep. farms, right? That was during COVID, during supply chain interruptions. Suddenly we all had a reason, DXA had a reason to show animal death again. But it's like we do really need to have a new reason to talk about animal mm. death in a new way. It's messed up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I don't. Uh, to the to these guys it's all the same story you you know honestly even if the last one was pigs and this one's cows uh, you know like like you said it's it's saturation i i think yeah i think the challenge is it's a tool but it kind of needs retooling um mm-hmm. I, i'm not i mean i i i obviously you know and you and i have worked on many and you know how many investigation undercover investigations i have worked on I'm at a point where I really have sincere doubts now about how effective they are, at least in terms of exposing systemic pieces uh, or systemic problems in in animal ag. And I, I know, you know, what's happening, unfortunately, is any blame, if there's any criminal level animal cruelty, the blame is falling on the low level workers who are immigrants and refugees, and they are not, it's not management, even if the target is management, management is never going down, rarely going down, I'll never say never. Um, these are, you know, rural communities where the farm owner plays golf with the DA and, you know, their kid is dating the sheriff's kid. And what I, I think we need new tools. I, I don't know if this is I don't I don't know if the under and cover investigation video in the classic sense is is really getting us where we need to be anymore. Mm-hmm. And and so open rescue has kind of taken the place. Uh, that's been a huge entry into systemic, uh, you know, problems with animal agriculture, the systemic problems. Um, and so, um, Wayne, do you feel like that's still riding a, a pretty solid wave? Or do you think that's going to sort of peter out as well, like undercover investigations? Yeah, this this relates to something Casey has said, which is important, which is the great thing about Open Rescue is it's gotten great coverage, especially when there are serious charges brought. And obviously, that comes with a huge amount of risk. And it's scary, and activists have to be prepared for that. But I do think it's risk that can be overcome. And I think we can win more of these cases. And especially if we win more and more of these cases. I mean, courtroom dramas are great stories. That's very true. Newspapers always report on what's happening in the courts. And especially if there's a lot of felonies being thrown around, a lot of industries and legislators and politicians animated by something happening in court, whether it's Harvey Weinstein or Dobbs in Roe versus Wade. You know, courtroom dramas are really valuable. There's a reason true crime podcasts and TV shows are the most popular stories in the nation and in the world, probably. Um, the trick is, and the hard thing is, you know, we're not getting enough of the animal stories. So we always try to pitch the individual animal story. And one of our great successes is, I remember when the New York Times covered an open rescue we did at a Costco cage for egg farm in 2016, they at least mentioned the name of the animal. And we were all so happy. <laughs> you know, they finally called her Ella and they, they used she, her pronouns instead of it, right? Wow. That was very happy for us. But still the main focus of the story was the fact that activists infiltrated this farm and exposed this cruelty. Um, but when it comes down to cover investigations or open rescues, I think the main thing is you always just got to have something to stink. I hate to, to beat a, I shouldn't say a dead horse, beat a dead human. Is that better? That sounds kind of violent. Sure, horse, you know, we'll go for it. <laughs> beat beat a living crowd. horse. Or no, no. Why don't we just say save a living horse? There we the go. best way That's to save right. a living horse is it's, it's just got to be new. So How about feed, before, a, feed a horse? <laughs> feed, feed a hungry feed horse. Feed a beautiful living horse. <laughs> in a okay. The best way to feed a living horse is to make sure before you do the open rescue or investigation, you already know what the story is. And the story can't just be, we investigated cruelty. It can't just be, we rescued an animal. It's gotta be something different. And so like the story for, for Matt Johnson, when he rescued a piglet from, I don't know ordinary factory farm in Iowa, this is before the VSD investigation, was that the person who owned the farm was a Senator in Iowa who was passing ag gag laws. And so the story wasn't just animal cruelty at a factory farm, it was, hey, this guy, he's a state senator passing ag gag laws, has cruelty his own farm. And that wasn't an investigation story, that was a corruption story that didn't, did, but that then did shed enormous light on the cruelty in factory farms. And I think going into all these stories, you should always have something new, a new angle beyond just there is systemic cruelty in animal agriculture. Because, you know, I think Kesey is right that that is saturated. It's, it's a story that's been told so many times. Yeah, I think we have to have multifaceted 
issues now, right? So we talk a lot about intersection of oppressions, right? But we also have to talk about intersection of what's going to piss people off. So again, mm -hmm. for example, we talk about the horse meat story now. Now we're bringing in politics, right? So people who are, you know, not really happy with the Liberal Party right now are going to agree with us. They're going to start saying, oh, yeah, right, horse meat, screw the horse meat industry, screw the, the export of horses from Canada, mm -hmm. because they already hate the Liberal Party. So mm -hmm. if you can bring people in from multifaceted spaces, politics, oppression, racial issues, workers, labor rights issues, there's a lot of ways in that you can tie animal rights, uh, and especially factory farming, uh, and environmental issues aren't the only way. There's a lot of things you can get people to care about that just happen to also be about factory farming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, uh, freedom of speech with the I gag laws. I mean, it's yes. it's been a huge. Uh, it's we've really been able to get a lot of coverage because of the I gag uh, new I gag laws in the, the country. I mean, obviously they suck, um, but we we've, we've been able to use them to bring attention to where the attention needs to go. Um, okay, so we are getting close to our time, folks, and I. this has just been fascinating, but this is the most important piece that I want to ask you today because um, we have a, a community here of uh, advocates who are very um, game and hungry to, to help out the best they can. Um, what are ways that AJAers here and other individual animal advocates can help in the mission to get more media for animals? So, uh, you know, give us some of the, some of the, uh, possibilities. Jess, how about we talked about letters to the editor? I always, I always tell um, advocates, write letters to the editor, because even if you're, you don't think you're a writer, you are a writer, anybody can write a letter. And uh, as I often say, in, in a lot of these workshops and the AGA pat, um, module, I think I did too, anything you think you're going to put in a comment on Facebook under an article, don't, don't just put it there, put it in an email to the editor, they can be very short, and they can be very impactful, because this is how we keep these stories in the media, this is how we keep the conversation going. And this is how we show editors that these stories are people that want to, that they, they want to read and they want to know about. So so definitely write your letters to the editor. Anybody can write them. The email addresses to do so are very publicly available. Um, and I would I would add to that too is is interact with reporters and editors online. Um, I find Twitter to be an amazing tool to interact with editors and reporters and let them know that these are stories that matter to you. Because the worst that can happen after, for example, when I write an opinion piece is that nobody says anything. If there's no reaction at all, whether on social media or in the letters to the editor page. That's the worst, then it dies. So mm -hmm. let the conversation continue on letters to the editor and social media. Yeah, I mean, Wayne, you were saying just, you know, how the Smithfield uh, New York Times piece, it had such legs. No, no, sorry, it was the Glenn's uh, Intercept article. It had such legs because the grassroots people were sharing it. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. And I think offering comments is really important. If you look at kind of Facebook's algorithms, Mark Zuckerberg has said this, that huge part of what they're trying to do is start conversations. And probably all of us have been on Facebook or on some other social media platform and seeing how these comment threads blow up. Oftentimes, unfortunately, it's some stupid disagreement of people insulting each other. And they're I, the, the social media companies are capitalizing something we understand about human psychology, which is that it's hard for us to avoid watching conflict. We had the rubber neck syndrome where we see people attacking each other and we kind of want to watch. I'm not going to say you should attack people because I just think that's unethical and we shouldn't feed into the social media company's tyranny over our attention spans. But I will say adding a personalized comment to whatever content you're showing is very important. But even better than that, that is adding a personalized comment that is social media friendly. And the best way to understand just kind of the data science behind what's social media friendly is in my view, a book by the name of Contagious by a Wharton professor named Jonah Berger. It's a great book that has a very simple acronym, STEPS, S-T-E-P-P-S, that anyone who's doing social media and is serious about it should read. And I won't go into more detail, but just check out the book. It's called Contagious by Jonah Berger. It's a great book. Amazing. Thank you, Wayne. Those are such good and something we all can do. Um, uh, speaking of letters to the editor, um, you should also be um, uh, aware of Dawn Watch, which is, uh, which is a, an organization that has been around for a very long time and was one of the organizations to first really get the 
uh, the movement going as far as letters to the editor go. Um, so Dawnwatch sends out uh, regular emails according to your geography of uh, media stories that are out there and so that you can support it by um, writing letters to the editor and usually give some talking points and everything. So um, yeah, Kirsten's put the... Uh, uh, the link into the chat. Um, and I just want to read Debbie. Debbie um, uh, Wall is, is we call her our AJA letters to the editor queen because she regularly gets them in major newspapers. Um, in fact, our AJAers have been amazing at getting letters to the editors in so many papers constantly. Um, and she said, remember, writing a letter to the editor is like throwing dirty underwear against the wall. Do it enough times, some of it is bound to stick. <laughs> That's her, that's her whole thing. It's so funny. <laughs> um, okay, Jenny, can you tell us about um, the Sentient Media Writers Collective? Because I think that's another resource that I'd love people to know more about. Yeah, um, so it's, and we're actually, <laughs> one of the many things we're changing, but. Okay, okay, um, sorry. <laughs> is, is there still, is it still a part? No, no, it's, it's good. It's all good, good okay, changes. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we have like 750 people in there or something like that. And so we're trying to actually like just sort of um, organize it a little bit better. So we want to have a space that's actually for journalists um, who are covering these issues. And we are also trying to bring in a lot of journalists now who are not admiral advocates who are just interested in these issues. And, and you know, we want them to, to get, we want to, you know, assure them they can get sort of like factual information and good resources from us. So we have a space in the Writers Collective for journalists and a space for advocates for people who do want to write letters to the editor, who do want to write op-eds. And so we'll, we have trainings, um, you know, aimed at people who want to do that and separate trainings for people who want to do journalists and then some events for everybody to come together. So that's kind of the idea of the Writers Collective um, is to have these different training resources for people who want, you know, for either for journalists and for advocates for anyone interested in writing, but we're, we're trying to organize it a bit. So, you know, it, it fits for who, for whoever you are, whoever you're joining. Um, sure. But um, you know, we, we have a Midwest cohort that we, what we launched, um, just a few months ago, um, where we had, where we were able to award, um, three journalists funding for their pitches to cover, um, animal ag stories that they're going to then pitch to mainstream media outlets. So we're really growing it as a space for journalists and to give them some of these like pitch guides and tip guides and source guides, um, so they can cover these issues. Um, but if you're an animal advocate, animal advocate and you want to join and write and learn how to write a letter for the editor to the editor we also have space for you and we you know we'll have um um webinars and 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 resources um and i'm available for everybody i give you <laughs> you can always email me and, and i'll give you advice on on how to pitch editors and that kind of thing so that's it's it's all there in the writers collective Amazing, Jenny. Thank you so much. I, I, even, I even teach you. a module. <laughs> I even teach a module in Writers Collective. I don't know if you oh, know great. that. <laughs> right. um, so and Jess does as well, right? <laughs> um, Keisha. Well, that's, sorry, go that's ahead. That's part Jenny. of it. Like making sure everybody can get all to all the modules is like organizing the space. But yeah. Wayne says, I want to join. Chapter. Add me to your list. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, uh, Keja, is there anything that you can suggest as far as individual animal advocates uh, can go to help this movement into more media? Yeah, I, the, the traffic and engagement is is really key for those outlets that don't, you know, accept any feedback. Uh, the writers and editors are always going to read the comments. You shouldn't read the comments. <laughs> but no, not reading the comments is a form of self care. Uh, but the editors and writers, uh, they do read them and they do appreciate it. Uh, I, I wish actually I could get my for-profit clients to listen to all of you talk about how important it is to just share the media coverage about yourself. Um, mm. They seem to have a problem with that too. Uh, but yeah, this is, it's really basic stuff. I, I actually like to tell organizations to have kind of a checklist because sometimes you're going to, you know, put it on Twitter, put it on your Facebook page, put it on your website, send it in an email to all of your donors, blah, 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 blah. You know, go, go, just do, go down the list. And anytime there's a nice story, do, do these things. It, you know, you just make, make your checklist one time and then you never forget in the future. Mm, I love that. And can I add just one thing to this for those of you that are posting stories, always 
have an intro that's personalized, okay? What does this story mean to you? Do you have a connection to it? Why do you think your friends are going to want to read it? You, you have to be a mini journalist, even when you're posting your, you know, sharing articles on social media. And, and that's the other thing, folks. The, like, the last thing I want to just say is um, newspapers and television outlets, they're not the only game in town anymore, by far. Um, there are um, uh, podcasts that have millions of listeners, blogs that have millions of views. Um, and so um, what's your experience as far even as- those that don't have, Sorry, even those that don't have millions of views, if there's a compelling story in a smaller outlet, it can still do really, it can still perform really well if we're sharing it and we're, we're getting our friends. You know, anything that's online is technically international. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go after the, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. You know, there, there's a lot of other opportunities out there for, for quality content. And this might be like a bit rich for me to say, considering I'm kind of new to the movement, but like, think of it as a long game, <laughs> as I say to people who've been doing it for much longer than me. But mm -hmm. I think of that more of like, when I think of the topics I've covered over the years, and when I talk to people in my life about these topics, like, if I try to convince them in a single conversation, which is, as my family will test, is totally my style, I'll be like, I have 17 facts for you right now. Like, <laughs> they're like, enough, like, shut up. So that doesn't necessarily work. But if I'm like, I learn to like, you know, pull it back and kind of like view it as like, this is an ongoing conversation. And I think of it as like people in my real life, it's an ongoing conversation. People on Twitter have been on Twitter forever. Like it's an ongoing conversation. I don't have to convince them in one. I don't have to convince them of anything. Like I'm just giving them facts. I'm listening. I'm spending a lot of time listening. Play the long game. Again, kind of rich coming from me considering I've been a vegan only for a year. But anyway. I well, think Jenny, that we are so happy lesson. to have you. We're so happy to have you as part of the family. Thank you. You're brilliant and wonderful. And, and we're happy to have you as uh, as the part of the vegan family. So, um, well, folks, we I wish we could continue this conversation forever. There, And I'm sorry, I only got to a couple of questions. Um, but um, Kirsten, can you put us back into the gallery so that we can, uh, our panelists can see their adoring um uh, audience here and folks just go, make sure you go up to the view and go to the gallery view so that you can see everyone. Um, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I just want to say before we say thank you to the uh, panelists is uh, make sure you check out all these resources. Also, um, folks, um, if you like what we're doing here at AJA, um, feel free to donate to support our programming uh, at Animal Justice Academy and at Animal Justice. Um, Kirsten's going to put in a uh, link which did didn't work, Kirsten. Um, but you can find us at uh, animaljustice.ca slash support AJA. Um, all right. So AJAers, was this helpful? Let's give our panelists a big thank you in AJA style. Woo <laughs> Um, Jessica, Keja, Wayne, Jenny, thank you so much for your beautiful wisdom. We really appreciate it. It was fascinating. I think we've come up with a lot of um, really helpful things. And, uh, and, and we're just so happy that all four of you are doing what you do so brilliantly. So thank you so much. Thank you guys so much.